Now, no. now it's recording. It, <laughs> I hit record on on Skype, and then it gives a little stutter. there. So if I start start if I start talking straight away, it misses that bit off, which is exactly what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's a it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast, buddy, and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. How how is how is Elliot Brown faring up in the current COVID nineteen situation? I think surprisingly well. Um, I feel very fortunate to have a business that's got a fairly large online capacity uh, to trade. Obviously, the appetite's a lot lower than it normally is, um, but we're very lucky that we spread our, um, our sort of customer base is, is, is kind of threefold. It's a lot of project work where we make special editions of, of our watches for groups. Some of those are ticking along or, you know, in the background all the time. So... We've, we're very lucky that we've got an income stream from that right now. Uh, obviously, High Street is uh, doing nothing at the moment and feel for all of our stores. You know, they're not having a good time of it out there. It's pretty tough and uh, hope hope that they all manage to come back. Um, and, and, you know, when they do, we'll be as supportive as we can be. Um, and then obviously we've got a direct to consumer side, uh, which is ticking along. We have a skeleton crew going into the office so that there's only one person there at a time. And we can th- keep things like servicing and the odd order you know, t- ticking along, but it is just ticking along. That's good. That's good. V- very lucky. I mean, like you're saying, somebody is so unfortunate with it. I did hear today, though, um, I'm sure I read it today, that some of the large, some of the larger like takeaway chains are opening back up. I don't know where I had that. I didn't know if I saw that anywhere. As if the restrictions are being lifted a little bit. I'm not sure. I've not heard that. I mean, I know a lot of, um, I mean, the local pubs and uh, wholesalers around here are opening up their businesses for, for delivery or sort of, you know, phone up and collect kind of stuff. Um, so that's obviously allowed and, and encouraged um, because there's not there's little human contact, but there's still travel involved. Mm. Yeah. Let's uh, let's get back on track. Oh, let's get onto the track. We haven't been on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> when you were a child, Ian. Did it ever occur to you that you were going to become part of some pretty big, pretty uh, well-known watch? Well, yeah, but predominantly watch brands when you were a kid. And 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 going back from my memories of um, Animal, the, the th- one of the things that sticks in my mind is the Velcro strap. So did you think as a kid, I'm going to be involved in some pretty innovative products. It's going to involve one watches and two Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, d- uh, it, it, simply, definitely not. No. But I did have to do a talk, and I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous about doing talks. So I did a lot of sort of inner searching to do this talk about my history once to a business sort of networking group and uh, one of the things that I kind of dredged up from my past was this love of of uh, I suppose it's it's just adrenaline just anything that I could do as a kid and I had no idea at the time that it was adrenaline surging through my body making me do more but from the age of about four when I nicked my sister's bike when I had measles I was off school with measles and I nicked my sister's bike and pointed it down a hill in the woods I hit a log, an old kind of knackered log, head over heels, landed in a, 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 a patch of wild garlic and undergrowth and got straight back up and did it again. And that was, that, that was my first recollection of having a, a really big hit of adrenaline, I suppose. But I didn't know it was adrenaline. I just, I just liked the fact that I could fly through the air upside down and land and it was okay. And, um, and I went through life just searching for things that gave me that feeling um, and, and ended up, you know, I was in that age group where, you know, I remember being um, at school and a mate's dad worked for one of the oil companies in America and he bought back uh, a flyer skateboard and uh, I, I, my sister suffered again. I went and nicked her roller skates and made a skateboard because they had little uh, trucks on the wheels. So you took one apart. One set of wheels at the front, one at the back, a bit of wood shaped a bit like a lozenge, and I had something I could speed down a hill on. Um, what's, a, what's a flyer skateboard? Explain to me what type of skateboard that is. So it was a plastic uh, skateboard. Um, 
It was bright yellow. It had clear wheels. Uh, I think they still sell them. I think they're still really popular now. I think they came back again. Um, but that was a, what was that? Um, a sort of a late 70s kind of deal, I suppose. And then, of course, skateboarding all went, went mental. And you know, um, there, there, were, there weren't many skate parks around. There was Slam City under the A40 in London. There was, there was one in Woking. Um, and then the parks started to spring up. And, and that, was, that was quite a thing. Yeah, and we and I went through school not really knowing what I wanted to do. I didn't enjoy school. I didn't like really like my life at school. I ended up in a grammar school, and we moved from Yorkshire to Buckinghamshire. And I ended up in this school. I knew no one, and it was very academic. And I wasn't very academic. I've got no idea how I got in there at all. Um, and I just did. I, I just specialised in the creative stuff. So the design and technology. I, I, I did a deal with my teacher to do the A level when there wasn't one. Um, he just took me, uh, you know, because because we got on. He was a skier. He was in the TA, and um, I, I qualified as a dry slope ski instructor by the time I was about 16. So when we went on school ski trips, I was kind of more mates with the PE teacher and the design and technology teacher, who were the two skiers in the school, uh, rather than a pupil, I suppose. <laughs> so. Uh, and, and I and I and I just felt like a square peg in a round hole constantly. Um, in what in what way? In what, in what do you just, mean? Just in the in the subjects that I was offered at school, it didn't feel, you know, I I, I, I didn't really have a, an idea what I wanted to do. So I went down the engineering route, um, which ended up being maths and physics. Well, that's pretty. They're both quite academic. Um, I, I retook my A levels at Windsor College. Um, didn't do very well again and then I just applied to universities that I thought were in cool places like Cardiff and Portsmouth because they had sea and I would, by that point I was into my surfing and windsurfing. So where were you before that where were you when you were in school? Uh, so originally Yorkshire up in South Yorkshire a little village called Sprotborough near Doncaster and then I moved to Burnham in Buckinghamshire and went to Burnham Grammar. I was at school right. with, Mike Ash with uh, folks like Mike Ashley. <laughs> I I I'd assume, I'd assumed you'd grown up near the coast, um, but not not in not in Yorkshire. Travelling yeah. travelling to the coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, going back to the degrees, did you did you get did you do did you embark on the on the uni journey? No, I went to Portsmouth Poly to study uh, uh, mechanical engineering. And I did about uh, 18 months, two years, and I was doing everything but working, really. Uh, I was helping to run the windsurfing club and the surfing clubs. We were down to Cornwall and Devon every weekend. Um, we, were, we were windsurfing constantly. If I get to the top of a tower block from my maths lecture, I could, see the, I, could, I could see the Solent. And you could see if it's windy or not. And I used to pass the maths lecturer going when I was going down and he was going up to the lecture. Uh, so I didn't, I, I didn't study as hard as I could, but uh, I did enough to get by and um, I actually left to set up a business. Whilst I was at uh, college, I was spraying designs on T-shirts, uh, which I had a, sort of a passion for all the sort of, I don't know, it came from a love of surfing and, and those kind of brands. And I used to cut stencils out of uh, metal, so uh, lithographic printing uh, uh, metal sheets, and make stencils, and then use spray cans and spray designs, and sell them in you know in pubs and clubs and to friends. And that was kind of funding uh, my life through college. And then I left to set up a business doing that. Um, obviously, whilst I was doing that, I was I was kind of selling mail order through magazines and uh, specialist magazines and, and things because there wasn't an internet, and uh, obviously I had a lot of time, so I was doing a lot of windsurfing, a lot of surfing, mountain biking, um, and went on holiday to South Africa and and uh, got the idea for a Velcro watch strap from a guy that had made a watch strap from a piece of Velcro that was actually a luggage tie, so it was like a if you imagine a, a piece of Velcro with a D-loop on one end and um, it might be used to tie, I don't know, 
something to you could tie a bunch of wood together with it for example a load of twigs together with it um and he'd use it as a watch strap and i was like that's cool and i went home and started playing um and uh i thought well this velcro isn't very comfortable and i knew there was a sail maker quite local so i went and bought a roll a whole roll of webbing like 50 meters of webbing which is like <laughs> felt like a lot um uh, and got to work on my mum's sewing machine taught myself how to use it made a strap and then and then realized that it was unbreakable it was infinitely adjustable and it had all sorts of cool stuff uh, and then one of my mates from Portsmouth a guy called Nigel uh, Broughton um, went to his uh, ex-girlfriend's party um, got chatting to him we kind of knew each other vaguely and his mum had had the idea of setting up a company uh, called Animal Bags so it was kind of like you know an elephant bag or a uh, a, a, a hippo bag or whatever for windsurfing kit and uh, my original business was called Suck Shirts with a Z all very American <laughs> and uh, I trademarked it and because uh, and, everything sucked at the time you know everything that was kind of cool to say oh that sucks um, watching too many videos of Wayne Bartholomew and surfers like you know that sort of stuff uh, way back that, that saying is back in now my kids say it like that sucks. Say yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that, that's how the, the watch strap thing started. Um, so we called it Animal. We designed a, a logo that we thought would be really cool to have something in it that you could use on its own, which is where the, the, the kind of claw element came from. Um, and uh, off we went. We had about, I think we started with about £250 each. Bought a limited company off the shelf, changed its name, bought some raw materials. Um, and I'd been selling my uh, clothing that I'd been spraying to a few retailers. And one of those retailers, a company called Splash, who are based in St. Albans, uh, went to the uh, London Boat Show, which is at Earl's Court at the time. It's like a 10 day show. And I don't know if you remember going to the sort of, I don't know, the ideal home shows and that sort of stuff. If you saw a crowd looking at something like the little vegetable slicing machines or that sort of stuff, we actually had a crowd. We had a little fitting booth and I would fit people's fit watch straps to people's watches with this little <laughs> booth. And it was unbelievable. And we left that show with about five grand in cash. And I thought it was the best thing ever. And that was that was the start of our business. And it was that felt proper then. I had completely forgotten because it's so long ago. I, well, it's not that long ago, though, really. I'd completely forgotten that Animal was started with the straps. Because my memory of Animal, the brand, is Animal bags, Animal watches, Animal straps, uh, and, and the clothing and all the other bits and pieces. I'd completely forgotten to start with the strap. How amazing. Such a simple... I mean, it's, the, it, it's, a, it's a cliche of the greatest of... of Many a business stories, it starts with something so small and so affordable and, and so simple to grow, in, right, to grow into what it did and then to take you on this incredible journey. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, and it didn't feel like, it just felt good that we'd managed to make some money out of this thing that we kind of liked making and being involved with. And my, I suppose everything just got shaped naturally from there you know we didn't have a plan to go and trade across lots and lots of different sporting areas it was just because I was into the, all of those sports when I was at college I'd, I'd I did an insurance job on my on some windsurfing kit so that I could afford the first mountain bike I ever saw in a shop <laughs> <laughs> which I shouldn't really say but it's so long ago um and uh you know, we used to fasten windsurfer sails to our skateboards and get get pulled over by the cops for absolutely flying down the prom in, in South Sea. And uh, we just went through life just enjoying one sport after another. And so this was a means of being able to do those things. I could keep doing those sports very quickly. I mean, I was traveling every weekend down to Dorset um, for mountain biking or windsurfing or surfing. It was the closest Way, way closer than going to sort of North Devon or Cornwall uh, from where we were in Buckinghamshire. So it, it felt very natural about a year into running Animal in Buckinghamshire to move it down to Poole. 
How, and, how uh, did? Sorry, go on. And obviously, Paul is you know was and still is a mecca for sort of water sports uh, and, and and anything with two wheels. And it doesn't have a it doesn't have any snow or anything like that. But there's there's there's, there's plenty of hills. They might not be the biggest hills, but they're pretty good. Um, the water sports absolutely incredible. You know, you've got places like Kimmeridge, which has got lovely natural waves. Um, you've got all the lovely beaches and you've got the enormous harbour with all of its different conditions. So you can pretty much get on the water and do anything, anytime. Um, so it just felt like the, the, the best place we could possibly base it. We were a little bit scared. We thought, well, are we going to survive being that far away from London? But and as it turns out, yeah, you can. How did it, how did it grow from... So you had, you had that day at the exhibition, uh, you had the exhibition, you got the five grand in your pocket, you got the, and that was all around the watch strap, right? And I, yeah. I'm assuming then you, you built on the other sort of easy to produce, cheap to produce, easy to sell items like your clothing and your bags and that. Because I come from a clothing background, we always had a bit of animal branded yeah. clothing. So we always had... You know, we'd buy ah. some Hanes, Hanes beefy tees or Hanes sweatshirts or whatever. And, and, and we'd always have uh, some animal um, sort of branded clothing right from day one. But the main cell was, was a, a little display which started off as wire um, and, it, and it just sold watch straps. And I would go to, I would travel around, um, had one of the very first mobile phones, you know, like those big, big brick things in a car um, Nigel was holed up in a in a bedroom in in um, uh, near Bournemouth with his girlfriend, um, and he would do the sort of admin, um, and and I would travel literally the length and breadth of the country, knocking on doors, and it could be a, a cycling shop or a surf shop or you know an outdoor shop or canoe shop or whatever it was, uh, trying to sell them watch straps, and they go, oh, well, I'm not a jeweller, why do I want to sell watch straps? And because they're they're for your audience. And I'd go back and back and back and, uh, you know, sometimes four or five times before they'd, they'd buy. And, I, you know, persistence pays, right? And being nice pays. Um, and, but it didn't pay very well, as it turned out. Because if I sold a pack of watch straps to a shop and I'd driven 100 miles to see the shop, I might make 50 quid if I was lucky. <laughs> so I ended up taking on agencies. Um, I used to sell, uh, what else did we used to sell? Uh, Billabong, uh, Reef. Um, uh, two lay roof racks, um, and we one or two other bits and bobs along the way. But uh, so I was an agent as well, and that helped fund uh, the trips. So it just made sense to carry these other things as an agent. So I'd carry bags of you know Billabong clothing and reef sandals and so on, um, and uh, and that and that helped that helped to pay the expenses, which meant that we made more profit on the watch straps. Um, and then as, as, as that started to get a bit bigger and better, we hired a bedroom in a, above a surf shop. Oh, it, was a sur it was a windsurfing and mountain biking shop called Surf Tracks in Poole. And um, we hired a bedroom above there. And then um, we thought, well, we've got, we ended up with a lot of uh, retailers selling watch straps. And then we developed more accessories. So we developed little retainers for sunglasses, um, and then we, 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 we had some help from Billabong, actually, to uh, make some wallets and some baseball caps. Um, so we were an accessory company, for, first and foremost, rather than a clothing company. And, um, and then we got to the point where we were getting, we had literally hundreds of retailer, retailers buying from us, because at that time there were hundreds of you know, retailers up and down the country. At one point, I think we had about 1,200 retailers. But of course, each invoice was tiny. So... And there weren't accounting systems like Sage and things like that. They didn't exist. Computers were pretty new, you know. We our first computers was a, I think we had a BBC computer and an Olivetti two eight six, um, and we had to pay someone a ridiculous amount of money to to get a program written for us that could administer and help us to print an invoice, send a statement, and 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 because we knew very early on that that was just too labour intensive to do manually. Um, so we were always kind of, I guess, thinking ahead. Um, we were always struggling for money because you, you, I don't know if you know what it's like in, in business, but if you make a hundred pounds profit and you want to, and you're turning over, say you say you're turning over a thousand pounds and you make a hundred pounds profit, and then you can sell enough to to turn over two thousand pounds, you've got to have enough money to buy the stock 
to sell two thousand pounds of the stuff, but you only made a hundred pound profit, and out of that hundred pound profit, you've got to find everything else. So as you grow, you need to find more and more and more money. And we were doubling and tripling in turnover every year, and found that really hard. Um, with I mean, we were we were you know we were borrowing from the bank, and eventually we we um, Nigel's brother worked with a guy called Morris Edgington, who was a, a fantastic aide to us, and he's he's a lovely guy. Um, and he worked for one of the, uh, he worked for Road Chef, I think he was the FD of Road Chef, the motorway service company. And he'd done some very innovative deals uh, where he had uh, uh, got some employee share ownership schemes going before they really existed and, and had kind of trodden, trodden some new ground. And he knew lots of banks and he helped, he helped to hold our hand uh, and eventually became a small shareholder in the business. Um, but that was always a tricky one, was, was financing the growth. Well, it's one of the ones I think, uh, you know, a lot of businesses fail. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of businesses fail just through God, a million different reasons. But sometimes, well, you know this, but sometimes businesses fail for a reason that seems kind of counterintuitive or difficult to understand from outside the business world. And that is, you grow too quick for yourself. You know, you're too you become you're too successful too quickly, and you haven't got the infrastructure there and the resources there, finance, money, time to be able to grow with it. Um, which is, you know, the grow and the growth of animal makes it makes it, makes it all the more remarkable, really. I mean, how, so on that subject, how you you know you got the borrowing on 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 the money side. What else, in, when you get rapid, unexpected growth, what, what's, is it better to just generally talk in a business, kind of try and temper the growth if you haven't planned for it? You can't. How, mm. I mean, when, you, when you've got, you know, I remember the day we launched watches. So it was uh, 94 and we made some samples. I'd spent about five years uh, trudging all of the watch shows all the way around the world, Basel, Hong Kong. Um, and we found a, a manufacturer in Hong Kong who uh, we knew from one of our sales agents who was a big sailor. And uh, a guy that owned a yacht that he sailed ran this watch company. So we went and chatted to him for a bit of advice. And he ended up going, do you know what? I really like you guys. I'll make your watches for you. He'd never made a stainless steel watch in his life. And uh, we were the guinea pigs. Um, so anyway, we made some samples. They were pretty cool. And we went and showed them to all of our retailers and secured orders for about two and a half million quids of the watches. And at the time, our whole turnover was about 800. So the day we launched watches, we tripled our turnover. And uh, why do you think the demand was so high straight away? Was it because the, the, the straps and the brand already had a... Had a a repetition. I, think, I think we'd done a reasonable job with the brand. We were quite irreverent, I suppose, in how we behaved. We, we de we've, I, I've never taken myself too seriously in business. And we would always have the kind of, um, what's, the right, what's the correct word, the unofficial party at a trade show. So, for example, we go to Manchester to... Uh, I think it was called Ski GB at the time, or Soltex was skiing an outdoor leisure trade exhibition. And um, we hired the Hacienda. And, and, and we, had, we had Jose Cuervo as a, as a partner at the time. So that was quite a, quite a wild night. And, and we'd always go around doing things like that. And, and it just felt fun. It wasn't, really, it wasn't really planned. We just went around having fun. And I think because we didn't take ourselves too seriously and we had fun. It kind of translated into something that people wanted to be a part of. And it was quite unintentional. Honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't part of a plan. Uh, it was just something that we did because it was fun. Um, and other people jumped on that fun kind of bike and had a ride with us. So when we launched the watches, it, it, it was with, they were colorful. We'd done our homework. They were stainless steel. Uh, they were, everyone was pressure tested. Um, and we were the first people to stick a stainless steel watch into the market at around, I think it was about 65, 70 pounds at the time. Um, and it was completely new. Um, there, there was, who was making watches at that time? Gull made a few watches. Um, and that was pretty much it, I think, um, in, in, our, in our space. 
Um, there were no, there was no digital stuff at all. And, and in fact, the market wasn't known for selling watches. So we felt there was a ceiling on how far or how high we could go on price um, outside of the watch and jewellery sector where, you know, you could go up to many thousands of pounds. We felt that outside of that, you know, we needed to produce something that was just exceptional value and affordable. Um, so we did it, but we did it with our kind of ethos of over making things or over engineering things. Um, and, uh, and it seemed to stick. But in, in terms of funding it, that was tricky. We were balancing a lot because we had, you know, a massive debt with the watch company. Um, and I don't know if you know what it's like getting money out of trade customers, but, you know, they don't pay on time. I know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so uh, with yeah. the best will in the world, we were having to bridge that gap. Uh, and uh, we managed it by the seat of our pants with some some really, you know, some really difficult conversations sometimes. Um but ultimately, we needed to go to the bank and borrow a lot of money. Um, so in the end, when, we, when, when Animal was much more of a clothing brand, we were pre-selling, I think about 80, 85% of our annual turnover was pre-sold. So the same way as we sold the watches, we'd make, a, we'd make a range of samples, we'd start designing them. So if you wanted to sell a summer range uh, in, so say we were doing a range for 2021, um, we would we would be designing that now, if, if you know at least eighteen months in advance. Basically, uh, we sorry we'd probably be sampling it now, and then we deliver samples sort of late summer to pre-sell for a couple of months, and then delivering it, delivery it uh, the following spring. Um, and eighty-five percent of our business was pre-sold, but at the time, those orders. Uh, the bank didn't class them as, as having any value to borrow, to lend money against. Um, there's, there's products now, there's financial products called, called stocking finance and things like that. But um, back then there wasn't. And it was really difficult to, uh, to make people understand that we had this really bankable business, but no one would lend against it. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was really, really difficult and it really frustrated us that no one got us None of the none of the banking world got us. We were like a square peg in a round hole, and it just felt like we were, you know, banging our heads against the wall all the time. Mm. Going going back a just going back a step, you mentioned um, uh, an ethos of maintaining an ethos of over engineering. Can you elaborate on what you mean and with that, in terms of animal? Um, so, if we made a T-shirt, the standard the standard T-shirt at the time. In the, in the industry, be uh, I don't know, 160 gram, 170 gram T-shirt. So that's the weight of the of the cotton. Uh, we made a 230 gram T-shirt. So it was like it was it was way thicker and way heavier than any other T-shirt. Um, you know, the neck rib was heavier. It, in hindsight, they were too heavy. They were too thick. But they lasted. <laughs> they lasted forever. And, you know, I still see people wearing our old T-shirts from 20, 30 years ago. You think, well, come on, buy a new T-shirt. But it, it, so we, we, we just, <laughs> just went about making stuff as good as we could make it. Because why not? Yeah. No, no other reason. It wasn't because we had to. We just wanted to. We just wanted to do a better job. We didn't want stuff to shrink and fade and you know yeah yeah i see i see what you mean um it's a, but it's a good one. it's funny about the t-shirts yeah uh, the but then you want that strength when you're doing all when you've got the client kind of clientele you had and all that oh, outdoorsy water sportsy flipping mountain bikey you know uh yeah goodness I me mean, we made some horrendous stuff you know, don't like get what? Wrong. What's your, uh, what's your, what product did you I, have? I remember one of the first, one of the first <laughs> long sleeve garments we made was a polo neck. We like, oh like, my god! It, so it had a roll neck. It was like a, it was like a, a washed out. It was an acid wash grey, uh, sort of long sleeve tee, with a ribbed polo neck that folded over, with a mint green and pink animal embroidered on the rollover. Of the that goes against uh, what I see as ever the animal stood for. Or stood ah, but, for. but at the time, <laughs> at the time, we thought that was super cool. 
and uh, and and it oh, it just wasn't. Did it? Did it sell? Yeah, no. it did. Yeah, it did. Did it? But we produced some horrors. I remember having a warehouse sale once. There was a like a peachy fluorescent orange uh, sweatshirt we made with like a. It, it, it was a really nice fabric, but not in that colour. It was really fluffy and really not. It was, I think it was probably a Polar Tech fabric, and um, uh, it possibly even recycled. And and it, it it just was a it just bombed. It was like when you produce a range of something, you um, you need a colour story. You need you need to give it some vibrancy and some life. And inevitably, those colours were always the pups. They would they would be the ones that would look great on the on the models or great in the photo shoot. But no one wants to buy it because you go, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I'll buy that one. And um, <laughs> but we just, I don't know how we made so many of these orange uh, sweatshirts, but I still see people around Paul wearing that sweatshirt that was, I mean, we sold them, I don't know what we sold them for in a warehouse sale because we just couldn't get rid of them for love or money. But it, there's still people in Paul wearing that orange <laughs> sweatshirt. I don't know. What was it like? What was it like? Um, dealing with when, when, it, when it came to it and you got that stage with Animal, uh, the, the big, big, big sponsorship opportunities. What, what was that like? Was that a, like an eye-opener for you with a different, kind, different type of business, different way of doing things? No, we absolutely loved it. Um, I think the biggest, the, probably the biggest success story is our downhill mountain bike team. We didn't really sell much to the mountain biking market, actually. Um, there weren't many mountain biking stores that wanted to sell loads of animal kit. But we were into mountain biking, so we were like, well, sorry, we're going to have a team. And when, so when Animal was really young, we were one of the first sponsors of the very first National Point Series cross-country mountain bike racing. Uh, there was a big, one of the very first rounds was down near Blandford in Dorset. A thousand competitors, and we gave every competitor a watch strap. And we thought, oh, that's cool. That's really good. So we figured that those people were... Uh, the best in their field so they were going to go back to their local town and mountain biking venues and speak to their mates wearing one of our watch straps and they'd probably be quite high, highly regarded so it's they were kind of unwitting ambassadors if you like and and that's how we did a lot of our marketing because we just didn't have a, a, a big marketing budget so we had to be really really canny and think of ideas that were going to work and it cost us, you know, buttons to give away a thousand watch straps in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, their retail price was four or five pounds, but the cost to make was a fraction of that. So, you know, maybe that cost us a thousand pounds, say. That was a thousand pounds really well spent. And then when we had our own mountain biking team, um, so when downhilling became a thing, we dropped all the cost country stuff. We're like, no, nah, we're, we're, we're just downhill now. That's it. Uh, we went and bought a ex um, motorcycle Formula One team truck with a workshop in the back. Um, a guy called Steve Kitchen, who's a good friend of ours, uh, approached us and said, look, I've got a bunch of guys. We've been BMXing for years. Uh, we, we formed a mountain bike team. Um, or can we form a mountain bike team? And he badgered, he badgered us and badgered us. And eventually we said, yeah, let's do it. So we bought this truck and at, at the, I think it was at the Malvern's, um, we had the truck right on the start finish line because we, we had the kind of biggest setup in the UK and we'd approached because we were making it into a real thing um, we, we approached people like PlayStation and Cadbury's and Audi and Piaggio and we got sponsorship from all of them so they wanted part of our team um, so we had orange mountain bikes uh, we had Piaggio pit bikes uh, we had PlayStation um, consoles that we take and effectively act as part of their marketing team. So we had like a cordoned off area with PlayStations that people could play. The bus had a, 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 like a deck on top and a ladder so you could watch the race from the top. Um, and we were, we, and, we, and obviously the, the team behaved themselves impeccably and didn't ever get drunk or do anything like that. And, 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 and there was no internet back then either. Oh, well, not quite. <laughs> not much. <laughs> um, so we ended up, we ended up, making an income out of our mountain bike team because of all the money we got in from the other sponsors. Uh. 
and it was and and it and it just flipped it all on its head. It was bonkers. It was really was bonkers. bonkers. But in other in other examples, um, we uh, we would typically have what you would call an exposure contract with a with an athlete or a or a sponsored rider. So um, a surfer might have so an exposure contract would be when they when they appear in a magazine or, or on TV or on the internet or wherever it was then there would be a sort of a rate card and we would pay them. Um, so that was almost like a kind of a, they were almost like our self-employed PR uh, people. When you, when you say rate card, would it be like if we, judging how much, how much exposure and time you got or, and on what, on what media? Yeah, it'd be, it, yeah, quite, quite roughly, you know, if it was a, it was, a, if it was an eighth of a page in a magazine, if it was a half a page, if it was a full page, if it was a, you know, double page spread, um, there'd be, various various rates and then when we got into the you know when we got to the point where the business was turning over quite a few million we actually started having a budget and and putting aside anywhere between sort of 10 and 14 percent of turnover uh, as a budget we were looking at what uh, various businesses were doing tag i remember at the time tag hoyer the watch company they used to put 20 percent of turnover into marketing well, well i've read because they made so much profit on the old formula one watch and that sort of stuff and people well, like I, Red Bull, similarly. But you've yeah. got to have a lot of profit to do that. Well, do you from the outset? Because I've read, um, I've read recently, just sort of in reading up on business and stuff like that, that you should be looking at 30% of your revenue being your marketing budget. Three zero. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm trying to think why. But is that it. staff? Is that staff and everything? Is that the whole marketing subject? You know, so is that all the staff that are running your marketing department and their expenses, and whatever budget you spend on, you know, on buying exposure for want of a different word. You know, you're 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 putting yeah. a logo on someone's back or giving someone some product or paying for an advert or a campaign or whatever it is. <clears throat> That's a really high percentage. Yeah, it seemed high to me, um, but I, I don't know. I th I think I thought, well, if you if you're starting out and you've got a a, a product with a pretty you know flex, well, yeah, pretty wide margin, then maybe you could achieve thirty percent from the start with the right product, with the right you know, just for the right business model. And it's about cash. It it's about cash. You know, you'd have to have very. You, I mean, there. There are really different media these days or mediums. You know, you can go onto a Kickstarter or a, pro, you know, a platform like that and you can pre-fund your idea now. That didn't exist then. We, we, our, our audience was trade. So whatever we sold, we would wait 30, 60, 90 days to see any money back. But we had to buy fabrics 18 months before we sold anything. Um, so your available cash really determines what you can do in terms of you know your marketing and everything else um and it's only when you start making some profit so if we if we when our when our growth slowed down a little bit and we were able to retain our profit that's when we had a marketing budget and we felt that was super high at the time mm. but maybe it wasn't who knows but yeah what? in terms of sponsorship you know your question about how how did we go about that and how did it feel I remember calling Audi and going, hey, we've got this mountain bike team. Do you want to give us a car? And they said, yes. And I was like, shit, I just called Audi and they gave us a car. That's mad. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, yeah, felt, it felt unbelievable. It didn't feel real. We didn't, we didn't think of ourselves as having this great big successful thing ever. We, just, we were just doing our thing. And people seemed to like it. And, and so when, when people said yes... And, and we could do some stuff. It was just, it was a fantastic. It just felt like the best feeling in the world. How did it, because <clears throat> I want to come on to uh, Elliot Brown at the time. How did, what did that journey toward the end of the, the animal journey look like? And then, and then you, what was your next, what was your next phase after that? So uh, animal, uh, we spent about five years in America uh, our, I mentioned before the sales agent who was a sailor. 
he went to live, uh, he met a girl um, uh, 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 who was a reporter, news reporter, and they lived in Atlanta. So he said, can I take Animal and I'll go and sell it from Atlanta? We were like, yeah, why not? Um, and he did okay. And then we set up an office in his basement and Nigel, my partner, and Andy, our sales director, moved uh, over and lived in Atlanta. Um, Andy didn't really like Atlanta very much. So he said, can we set up an office in San Diego? <laughs> so we were like, okay, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. There's a lot of surface in San Diego. Let's go there. So uh, we had two offices, one in Atlanta, one in San Diego. And um, speaking very candidly, we didn't do a very good job. We, uh, we went there with a product range that we thought was cool and that would be accepted. And ultimately, that was accepted, but it took too long because we were spreading ourselves too thinly in this massive country. And we, we've been going to shows and exhibitions there for years. We felt we, felt we knew the market, but we just didn't. We, we ticked, we're just different. We're, we're just met, built of different stuff. Um, and in hindsight, we should have employed Americans to run it for us there, but we didn't, we put Brits in. And um, plucky Brits thought we, thought we knew what we were doing. And we spent a lot of money with those two offices, trying and trying and trying, reinventing ourselves, making product that we thought was right for the American market, but it wasn't right for anywhere else. And it wasn't really right for the American market either. When actually our first product, if we just stuck with it for longer, would have would have probably been a great success. What was um, it? Sorry? What, what was it? Watches primarily. We made a, we made a digital watch. We called it the bug watch. Um, I'll show you on one day. It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, show me that. I love it. I love it. I love it. The, 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 the bad side, the bad stories are always as good as the good stories, aren't they? The it looked watch. like some sort of pre prehistoric beetle on your wrist. I mean, it was, we thought it was the coolest thing ever and it just bombed, it was rubbish. So um, we were hemorrhaging money, spending a lot of money out in America. And, and, and obviously it was a distraction as well. Um, and it got to the point where we just said, you know, we, we're, gonna have to, we're gonna have to stop this. And we'd been carrying that, that cost and that debt. But when we closed that business down, it crystallized the debt on our accounts. And, and there was some technicality in, in terms of our uh, bank lending and it changed our gearing. And I didn't really understand what that was at the time, but what it effectively meant was that we had to sell the business uh, because the bank wanted their money back. So we had about a three million facility. We had a great bank manager. Um, he, he was super helpful. There was a super trusting relationship. We could say to him, hey, we need, we need half a million quid for three months. Is that okay? It's on top of what you've agreed. Yeah, that's no problem. And we, we don't always honor it and we never put a foot wrong. But because we didn't kind of fit into one of their, their little uh, boxes in terms of we weren't a fashion business, we weren't technically a sports business, we were this kind of in-between thing. Um, the fact that we were pre-selling most of what we sold didn't matter. Uh, and they said they want their money back. And that put us into a pretty nasty position where we had to go and beauty parade the business around to raise. We needed about between three and five million pounds to really fund the business and take it forwards. And the markets just weren't interested in anything sub 10 million. At that time, it was just they're, they're, the markets go through trends. And I remember sitting in these offices in London in these kind of brokers and business finance agents and finance houses feeling like a fish out of water, um, presenting the business with a, with a pack. Um, and um, ultimately, we sold to a business that banked with the same bank and uh, bought us for a fraction of what you know the business was actually worth with our hands high, you know tied firmly behind our backs by the bank and it was one of the worst experiences of my life it felt like losing a child you know I know when you listen to an interview with a an Olympic athlete who's got an injury and they can no longer uh, pursue this this complete all-encompassing thing that they've done for years they're suddenly forced to stop or like someone being in the military and having a you know a horrific injury and suddenly that career is over and you have to completely reinvent yourself. Um, that's what it was like. It was horrible. I hadn't realized that that, that was the way it, it had gone. Flipping heck. Absolutely. I, I've, I've spoken about this before, the, this, the, this, the similar journey from a military getting out, the culture shock and the, 
the culture shock and a complete change in uh, the loss of sense of purpose and sense of direction to sport to athletes and i've likened it to people who for example get made redundant all of a sudden or people like yourself ah man that must have been horrendous to, for something that you grew from the start to then be uh, end up in that position you know, it's in you. The only reason we traded across all the sports was because of our personal love of those sports. The people that we employed were our friends. You know, the, the things that we made were the things that we wanted to make because we liked them. It was, yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot of good about it. And I, I had, you know, I had my future set out. I didn't want anything, anything else. We had a decent income. We could have nice cars. We could live in the countryside. We could have a nice lifestyle. And, yeah, and suddenly it's just, it, it was ripped from under us. And um, that, was, that was pretty hard took a good couple of years to uh to get over that when when did that happen so that was 99 um okay. when we sold um and uh i took a year off managed the extension of a, a, the build of an extension on the house with we did get some money out of it but not you know it wasn't it, it wasn't much um we were we were persuaded that an earn out was a was a good way of being paid for our business an earn out is where you promise that your business will perform at a level and then if it doesn't you don't get any money <clears throat> and of course what you don't realize is that the the performance of the company is now out of your hands and so yeah. and so they didn't perform and they didn't give us any money so we got our first bit of money and that was that oh my god <clears throat> so there was a headline number but we didn't get anywhere near it uh so you had to start again so, um, but it, Animal doesn't exist now, though, does it? Yeah, it does. But in what? I just sort of, yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. Yeah, but it's more, it's predominantly clothing now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. very much. And they've got their own stores up and down the country. And, uh, and many sort of, um, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, there's many retailers who, who uh, they own their store, but they only sell Animal almost like a licensee, I suppose. Um, there's quite a few of those as well. Right, okay. Yeah. But, but, it hasn't worked out so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you pick yourself up, don't you? <laughs> where, where, where are you now? Elliot Brown, mate. How, how did you get, how did you, how did you so, decide to focus on watchmaking? So, well, very quickly, uh, when we came out of, of Animal, I got involved with the motor racing business for a bit just because I like driving and like driving fast. That didn't work out. Um, and then I set up a design agency uh, with a girl called Bella, and we called it Salad. And Salad Creative is still going. It's a very successful agency. Bella's doing a cracking job with it. Um, it's on the key in pool. So I, I figured that all of those skills that I'd used in the days of Animal, you know, were they transferable? And I wanted to kind of prove to myself that they were um, and try and advise other businesses on, on marketing strategy, uh, design, you know, copywriting, all those sort of things that we used to do ourselves. Um, so we set Salad up to be this kind of uh, full service agency. Uh, we employed a designer and, and we went out and we made a brochure which... Uh, was full of things that didn't really exist but look good um, and pretended that we designed them and uh, and so that we could show potential clients some some work and uh, uh, managed to win some business and then we got into all sorts of sectors from automotive to uh, estate agency to uh, insurance to food uh, to building um, cleaning product or, you know just a full a, a full really interesting range of stuff and it might be a complete a complete rebrand or it might just be a tweak we'd often say why do you want a you know you come to us for a new logo what why do you think you need a new logo you just bored of it and we we were the worst sales i was the worst salesman ever but it felt honest and we banned we banned any kind of uh, marketing uh, above the line below the line kind of language there was no there was no bull um, anybody that taught bull was like, no, you're out. And, and, that, and that determined our clients. And we did pretty well, but I felt like a hamster in a wheel. And whilst we were doing that, I, did, I mean, I did that for about 10 years. Nice office overlooking the water on the quay, good reputation. Um, but I stayed friends with Alex Brown, who was the horologist at Animal. He'd moved down from uh, London to come and work for us in Dorset, turned down a job at Cartier. 
Hierologist, hierology, watches. Yes. And, uh, and, and we, we, we stayed pretty good mates. And um, I'd go to Alex with some watches that needed a battery change from time to time. And we stayed quite good mates. And we were chatting one day and we said, hey, with all our skills, you know, why don't we, why don't we make some watches? Because we've got some pretty unique skills. He's, he sits in a, in, a, in a place where he's seen and advised on watch design, what can and can't be made. He's, he's overseen production and then he's run the whole sort of after sales servicing department. So we've seen the whole thing and that's really rare in the watch, in the watch world. You don't even get to see a bit of it normally. Um, so he has a more rounded set of experience than I think anybody I've ever met. Um, and, and I've got very complementary skills, you know, on the kind of uh, marketing sales, um, brand creation kind of side of things. And um, our, our initial idea was, should we, let's, let's make a, a watch that's about two or three thousand pounds. That'd be great. And then we thought, mm, yeah, maybe you need quite a big budget to make that <laughs> into a thing that people are going to want to buy at that sort of money. Um, so we kind of went full circle and, uh, and ended up just going, do you know what? Let's just make the best damn watches we can make. Let's put all of that unique knowledge into something. We'll make the best thing we can possibly make and then see if people want to come and buy it. So we spent about two and a half years working nights. So Alex would come over to the design studio. Um, I'd persuade uh, Andy, our head of design, to stay on quite often. And we'd sit with him and then we'd start working through literally every single facet of the business. So fr from the brand and the, and the logo uh, through to the first uh, watches and product ranges to the typography and the kind of brand guidelines. Um, and then we put together a, a, a proposal and uh, I didn't know, I, I felt quite uh, unconfident, I suppose. I didn't know whether my um, history at Animal and latterly at Salad would mean anything if I went out to a potential investor and said, hey, do you want to invest in us? Um, and uh, thankfully it did. Um, so we went and raised some money, some, some, some working capital. And we started, we opened the doors to Elliot Brown in March 13th. Awesome. Um, mate, when, you when you're designing a watch, right, I, I only sort of, I mean, the precision and the mechanical engineering behind them, I think is completely underappreciated. Uh, certainly I've been by me up until recently. Where on earth do you start when you're designing a watch from scratch? I mean, the actual, the, the, the physical watch where, where do you start with designing it do you just start from the outside and work in or, or what a bit of both so we're we're not a movement manufacturer right so we buy uh, really good quality movements from switzerland or from japan and and that's like the engine that goes inside so what we're effectively doing is we're making a really rugged waterproof box for that engine to sit in right so our skill comes in how how can we make this box more rugged more attractive longer lasting easier to use than anything else and that's where our skills from animal really pay because we'd spent i don't know how many years making and developing watches that were going to get absolutely hammered um but we were we were limited on how much we could sell them for like that original watch we put into the marketplace at 65 70 pounds you know, still outside of the watch and jewellery market, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can sell a watch for. And um, so we'd managed to do all that stuff at a really low price. Well, now we didn't have a price restriction on us because we were planning to go to the watch and jewellery market. So we were like, well, we can just do anything. So we, we started going to town on things like, well, if you had a gap between the movement and the case, instead of filling it with a bit of plastic that looks like an airfix, airfix kit, Let's make a shock absorber where you've got this side of the case and you normally have a little crown that screws down onto a little rubber donut like an O-ring and that's your seal for the crown. Why don't we build a couple more into the case and give it a triple seal so that it always works? doesn't matter whether the crown's in the in or out position. Um, instead of using these flimsy little spring bars that are a bit like a toilet roll holder, that's really thin metal and if the strap gets a big pull, they just break instantly. Let's use something solid. Let's screw it in. It was just it was just really simple stuff. Um, that glass that you put over the top of it 
instead of making it a, a millimeter thick, let's make it three millimeters thick. And then we do, and so so you kind of start with this specification of everything you need, and then design around that. So you're designing around the movement and around this this uh, set of parameters, I suppose, that we set ourselves, um, and 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 everything just kind of built up from there. And we had a we had a you know we created a mood board, shapes, surfaces, um, and and our watches aren't designed with any kind of um, uh, market research of any of any type. We just make stuff that we want to wear ourselves, and hope that it's good enough for everybody else to want as well. <laughs> the nice watches, mate. Why why haven't other manufacturers watch manufacturers in the past? taken that that approach that you're taking to it because they don't have our background to, to, to the okay you, they don't have right. our background at all do they they don't have that i mean we're outdoor enthusiasts at our hearts we're not we're not uh, classic swiss watchmakers at our hearts so we're we're kind of um we're more like our customer i think if that makes sense um but we've got this really really unique set of of, of knowledge and skill that's been built up over many years that we can uh, so for us what we do isn't difficult but for someone else to do it it'd be really hard because they don't have that experience and I think that's the thing that's the difference it would be very hard for someone to do what we do how we do it there's nothing you stopping do... anybody doing it no no it's not um, apart well I don't know I suppose it's the whole it's the whole business is built on not not doing it like that to make a big change and incur a big cost i mean how do you uh, how do you test the reliability of your watches because i'm, I'm going to guess i'm going to hazard a guess you don't do it like in, in a normal kind of way in in uh, in a controlled environment in a in a lab <laughs> <laughs> well we do we do that but well, we that as well. It, that as well. But we don't do well. it. But we don't do it like the rest of the industry does it. So if you were to walk down a, if you were to look in your local jeweler's shop window and look at all the watches in there, and you know you might they might have some sports watches, and you looked at the dial of the sports watch and it said it was waterproof to, you know, 150 meters or 200 meters, um, about the average is about three to five percent of those watches have every any ever been near a pressure test. So at least 95% of those watches have never been tested, but they're sold with 200 meters on the dial. And to us, that's dishonest. That's not the way that you should behave. If you say it's got 200 meters on the dial, you should know it can. But with what, what the industry works on and is, and, and is the accepted norm is that if you've tested a small percentage and you've made the others on the same production line, they're all the same. The other, the other side to it is as well, probably, is that how many, what percentage of the people buying are going to go to 200 meters of that watch on? Very, very, very well, few. No one is. No one is. But you might, fall off, you might fall off a water ski and hit the water really hard and put a, you know, a high equivalent pressure on it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think you're right. I think that the majority of, of the businesses out there uh, rely on the fact that the, the, the majority of the customers won't use their watch super hard we don't do like that so much like the old animal t-shirt at 230 grams we're like right how can we test this stuff what can we really do to it so every single one of our watches goes through three pressure tests and two of those pressure tests are during its build uh, which are in air so it goes into a little chamber it's pressurized under air pressure and there's a little um like a meniscus column, like a thermometer column attached to that, to that chamber. And once it's pressurized, they leave the chamber for about 10 minutes. And if any watch, if any air pressure passes the seals and gets into the inside of the watch, which is at a lower pressure, then the little meniscus changes and they can see that it leaked. Uh, so we do that to every watch twice to make sure they're okay. And that's at about 150 meters worth of, of equivalent pressure. So that's like going down under the water 150 meters. So every single watch that we make goes through that twice. And once it's past that, then we put them into a, a pressure vessel that's filled with water and pressurize it to 200 meters or 300 meters for the Tynum. So every single watch we make has been at 200 meters or beyond in water. 
And I'm not aware of another watch business in the world that does anything like that level of testing on anything at any price. The and, we, uh, go on. and it means we can sleep at night. Because if you wanted yeah. to go and climb Everest and you bought any one of our watches from a jeweler, I'd know that any one of them was going to perform. Anyone. And that's all I need to know. And that's all you need to know. Yeah, especially at the top end of the most extreme sports, you need that reliability, don't you? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be comfortable having it. Not if I, if if the if the watch was a critical piece for me. Um, you, but when when I came down and visited the office with Dell, you would just. I don't know if you could talk about it yet. You would send a couple of watches down. Mm -hmm. the, not, where, where's this going out? Well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, uh, how long a delay do you need if we're going to talk about it? End of May. Oh God, no! Let's because <laughs> <laughs> we haven't uh, got any of those watches that did that thing oh, at the moment. So oh, we, we were waiting till they come back. Anyway, let, let, oh, uh, we could still we could still talk about it though. Yeah. All right. So, so we do lots of other testing, right? And we do real world testing. Uh, we, we stuck a watch on uh, uh, water and mounted it to a post in Pool Harbour. Uh, originally, we did it for a month. We actually was going to be a week. We put it down in October. Um, uh, a, a guy called Steve Truella, who's a really good underwater, very well-known underwater photographer and uh, an author um, and friend of ours, uh, has got all the diving gear and all the cameras. So he went down and took pictures of it, mounting it to the post. We thought, well, let's leave it for a week and see what happens. And uh, so he went down after a week, took some pictures of it, fine. So uh, then he was going to come back two weeks later, but the weather was really bad. So it was like a month later. Sorry, what, what was it mounted again? Because you broke up at the it start. It was just and mounted said... to a metal post in the, in the harbour. Underwater. Underwater, permanently underwater, yeah. Uh, so after about a month, he went down and took a picture of it again. And it was starting to silt up a little bit, starting to get a little bit of gunge sort of growing on it and... Uh, anyway, he went down again, I think it was probably end of, end of November, something like that. So it had been in the water two months now and there was stuff growing on it. And then we had a nice weather spell in December, went down again, couldn't see the watch, just stuff growing all over it. Um, and then the weather was really bad and we eventually pulled it up in March and it was still ticking <laughs> and you couldn't see the face. There was stuff just growing all over it. And, uh, we call it our Harbour master and, um, because there's other watch uh, models with the name Master after them that exist, and we thought it'd be quite cool to have one of those. So um, yeah, we called it the Harbour Master, and that's that's quite a thing. It's still in our office, and we've shown it to lots of people, and we have to encourage them not to clean it because the first thing when you see a dirty watch and you've got hold of it in your hand is to try and rub it off, and we're like, no, 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 leave it. So that was the first test. That was the first real big test we did. Uh, another one we did was with our metal bracelet and a couple of straps and the crane in the boatyard where our office is. And I, I hung onto the straps and the crane lifted the watch up. And the only thing that was holding me in the air was the strap, uh, one of our metal bracelets. Uh, that worked OK. Didn't break. G good job. <laughs> uh, then we got involved with the Clipper race. And we sent a watch around the world, uh, mounted to the bottom of the mast on one of the boats. Uh, we had mounted one watch to the bow of one of the boats, but the bowsprit got ripped off. Um, it, 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 there was a massive storm and the, the yeah, the, the bow strip and the watch went with it. Um, so the second running of the race that we um, were the timing keeper for, uh, we put a couple of watches on the bows of some of the boats and they made it all the way around the world. So one of those watches was straight out of the box, nothing special, put it on a metal bracket using its own watch bars. It wasn't held on with anything else other than its own little strap, strap bars. Um, the bracket was screwed to the front of the boat and that watch has hit every single wave, object, you name it, for 12 months. So that's, you know, just really intense uh, kind of, you know, war for a watch, I suppose. You know, the pressure that that's hitting every wave with when those boats are, are hammering down through the Southern Ocean, the temperature differences, the UV, the constant salt water. We can't think of a test just we still can't think of a test that's tougher than that for a watch ever and and more than one came back working so that's quite cool and then the recent test was sending one down really 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 deep to see at what point it would fail and um reaching reaching 
1921 meters still ticking <laughs> for a 500 pound watch is, 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 is pretty damn cool in our in our book you know that's a proper <clears throat> test so that's nearly a nearly a mile and a quarter nearly a mile yeah. and a quarter under the, yeah. under, under the ocean right? 2800 psi unbelievable we still can't get our heads around that and the only thing that failed was the glass the seals are still intact so so at that point at that at that depth it, the 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 seals failed no 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 so the seals so, were uh, intact but the what at, failed at 19 at 1921 meters it was still ticking perfectly and then it went down lower it went down lower to just beyond 2 kilometers and and the the ROV was doing some work at that depth and when it got to that depth the hand stopped moving and we think it was because the glass was just bowing under the pressure and and touching the hands um and then the glass shattered because of the pressure so if we'd had a thicker glass who knows it could have gone deeper but it it, it failed at, at two kilometers <laughs> <laughs> and what's really nice is that we see a lot of you hear a lot of articles about watches going deep with someone wearing them but they're inside they're inside like a mini submarine oh and you, and you think well that's pressurized there's no, there's no point in doing that. This is just on the outside, in the elements. See how far it'll go. Yeah. And it, yeah. yeah. And it, and it held its head up high. Yeah. I mean, that, that is astounding. That depth. Um. So we can reveal that your... model soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's um, who's your biggest market at the minute? If you, if you, well, I don't know if you want to talk about it or not. So you, just interest me. So. As I said right at the beginning, we've got several audiences that we that that, that we sell to. Um, there's the so so we 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 our biggest single market is the uh, trade retailers. So we sell uh, watches as a as a wholesaler effectively to watch and jewelry retailers. So they've got bricks and mortar stores, online stores, and um, they resell our watches as as a, as a brand. You know that they stock much like they stock all the other brands. And um, that's a that's a big part of our business. Uh, so we you know it creates a, a, a lot of work around it, uh, supporting those retailers. Um, it is a constant you know a constant thing we 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 we're always working on. Uh, but it's good. That's what we used to do at Animal. So we know that we know that pretty well. Um, we sell direct to consumer. We've always done that from day one. Um, the the market for a brand that's as specialised as ours. Um, in the retail jewelry sector is quite limited. So unlike a fashion brand that could just sell to every retail jeweler, we can only sell to retail jewelers who want to tell our story because we are specifically this kind of go-to outdoor uh, rugged watch. We're not a, you know, we're not a fashion watch. And we're not as cheap as some of the fashion watches either because of all the tech and all the work we do and the testing and so on. Um, so it's a more considered purchase. So it's so that so the, the 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 market for that's a little bit more rarefied than some of some of the other brands out there. So to support us as a business, to give us the sort of gravitas that we need, um, the marketing budget that we talked about, and so on, uh, we do sell direct to consumer. But we we try really hard not to compete with our retailers. So we don't ever do any SEO on our site. Um, it's really there as a brochure site, and obviously our job is to. Um, create really interesting stories and content that people want to hear about because it's interesting. So we uh, naturally have aligned ourselves with uh, people that are kind of like us, I suppose. You know, they're out there doing their thing, be it summiting Everest or rowing an ocean or, or doing some, you know, doing a really extreme <coughs> run or walk or, or cycle or Whatever it might be, um, you, you know, there's some absolutely incredible people out there, um, and and we get to know them as friends and uh, find out what they need. Uh, they might be really chuffed that they get to wear one of our watches for nothing. Um, no money changes hands. We're not very um, commercial in that way. So when we had Animal, we had, for example, we sponsored Sonny Garcia, who was the number two and sometimes number one surfer in the world. 
and I think we gave him something like eighty thousand dollars to wear one of our watch straps and watches and put a sticker on his board. And when I turned up at the Triple Crown of Surfing in Hawaii that we also sponsored uh, to go and meet him and to see him compete, he wasn't even we- he wasn't even wearing a watch and he didn't have a sticker on his board. So paying people for us is is it's not real. You see advertising campaigns all the time with, I don't know, John Travolta advertising a watch and he's got some big shades on and <coughs> a helmet and he's just jumped out of a jet. Or I don't want to belittle anybody in particular, but I just think that the, the, the way that some brands market themselves is, is almost helping to accelerate the sort of commercialism and the consumerism. And we're kind of anti that. We want to make stuff that lasts for years. We're kind of anti-fashion. You know, we don't follow any trends with what we do, de- almost deliberately, um, because it's not real. Do you know what I mean? We're not a fashion brand at all. Fashion's the antithesis of what we do. Um, we want to make stuff that you can put on and it'll last literally for years and years, and we can keep repairing it and putting it right for you, and then it's got a story, and then it becomes a thing, and that's what we're about. So that's one of the reasons we don't pay ambassadors uh, we might sometimes, if someone's going on, I don't know, a, a, a super crazy mission, uh, we might give them some expenses to help them get there. Um, but it's definitely not like the kind of exposure contract that we used to do at Animal. It's definitely not that. Yeah, I think uh, so. I thought a lot about with with the, the the podcast is concerned, and when I sort of started venturing into the the sponsorship, the whole sponsorship thing, completely new to me. And uh, and I've always thought in in a similar in a similar way to really what what someone representing your brand should feel really they should be I mean I'm talking about watches here and functional things right because it, for other things it's not the same but functional stuff they should, they should be wearing it because they want to wear it there's, they've got a need there's a need there a genuine a, a genuine want as uh, over and above that you know any any payment or Anything else? That's what I think. Otherwise, because <clears throat> so I think anyway. Because otherwise, it's um, for me, it's like a false representation. So my you know, my sponsors in the podcast, I've been offered sponsorship out for other, with other companies in addition, where I've which I've turned down because I don't know them. It's not that they're bad, but I don't know them. I can't genuinely at the start of the podcast when I do my plugs go talk about. X, Y, or Z company because I, I don't know them. For me, I'm telling lies. Then <laughs> you, it's you know it's the same with it's the same with a with a, uh, an um, ambassador is going to wear something just because they're going to get some pay some money out of it. It's, it's sort of not the greatest ambassador you want. <laughs> well, it's it's really interesting, right? Because on the one hand, if we were to pay, I don't know, say I was mates with Bear Grylls. And we were to give him a stack of cash to wear our watches and use him in an advertising campaign. I'm sure we could be commercially successful with that. But I also know, everybody would know that we're paying him to wear our watch. So is he wearing our watch because he wants to and it's cool? Or where is he wearing our watch because we're paying him? And that's the, that's the tricky bit. And I think when you realise that someone's been paid to wear a product and it's just placement, then it loses its cachet. The flip side of that is if you make something good enough that people want to wear it because it's a tool, it's a, like a tool watch, it's a, it's a thing that's going to help uh, be this reliable thing, might help save their life one day, then that's different. So we, we, do, we do that. We make stuff that's, that's so durable, you know, so reliable. We've tested it to an nth of its life, to know that it's good enough before we sell it, then that's what we do. So it's, it's, it's very, very different to paying someone to put something on and promote it for you. Mm, that makes sense. <clears throat> makes sense. What's next on the horizon for Elliot Brown and for Ian Elliot? Ooh, good question. We are absolutely loving where we've got to. So we're... Um, seven years in um it's been a the last two or three years we've had a little bit of frustration because one or two circumstances have 
felt a little bit like the rug's been pulled from under our feet. So right now, for example, we've got everything stacked up this year, and I'm sure lots of businesses are in the same position this year, where we could be having the absolutely the most phenomenal year we've had to date, making enough money to be able to make decisions to employ more people, to spend more on marketing, to develop new models. Um, but it's not going to be like that, is it? So um, we're going to have to you know, take stock when we go back to work, look what, look what the situation is, um, look at what our resources are, and, and rethink everything, you know, maybe rethink some of those plans. We've got some really exciting uh, watches in development. We're constantly, constantly coming up with new ideas. We must infuriate a lot of people with all the ideas we come up with. Um, I can't talk about some of them, um, but uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting time in the future. We've got some ideas around uh, something that's, that's got much more function than anything we currently make. Um, it might have some military application. It might have some safety application. Um, that's a really exciting part. You know what it is because we talked about it. Um, and then uh, we're doing things like uh, we're just launching a new webbing strap. Uh, did I show you that when you when you came to see us? Yeah, you did. <laughs> so like that's, that. that's, been, that's been three years in the making. And we're constantly coming up with ideas. And that, this is the first iteration of that strap. So we've gone back to the webbing company in, in Ashbourne in Derbyshire who used to make our webbing for us at Animal, weaving beautiful slices of webbing on a Victorian shuttle loom that works about a tenth the speed of a normal loom. And it has to have someone constantly changing the little bobbins. We've gone down to how many twists of yarn there are in the thread to make exact exactly the right density so that our little buckle that we've made has a beautiful satisfying click you know the germans have got what they call vorsprung dorf technique and we've just got a satisfying click <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and we've managed to get our first patent on this buckle that we've that we've designed so we've got this really lovely hinge buckle that um it it, it, it follows the contours of your wrist it's a retainer for the tip of the strap as well as a buckle. Um, it's got this lovely little roller and clamp lock. It doesn't require any holes uh, that can fray. So we've kind of reinvented the NATO webbing strap. It's much lighter. It's much lower profile. It doesn't absorb water. It won't smell. And, and we've spent a lot of time over-engineering this strap. Um, and we're just, just literally launching it at the moment um, whilst we're all in lockdown because we figured... Hey, you might be, you know, a watch might be a bit, a bit, a bit too far of a, of a reach, but a really cool webbing strap probably isn't. So, please tell me that you are at some point going to do a heritage uh, Velcro strap. <laughs> 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 I would buy that in a, in a, in a click of my fingers, mate. Buy that in an instant. So that Velcro strap <laughs> was quite a thing, right? I mean, we we were a million of them a year and that's why this new straps come about because that that is my heritage that is the that is what started my first proper business and it was a hell of a ride and i've always wanted to have to develop something that was more sophisticated longer lasting didn't smell uh you could still make them colorful um just much cooler so We'll send you one of these new webbing straps, and then I'll, and then tell me if you want a new a, a new Velcro one because I I think you'll like it. But no, we're not going to make a Velcro strap. Oh, God's sake! Well, I'll try and change your mind over uh, over time. I can teach you how to make one. <laughs> <laughs> Where um finishing off, anything you want to mention? Uh, before we before I close it off, obviously as well as where where people can find you. Yeah, online, elliotbrownwatches.com. And uh, we're obviously super active on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Follow our stuff. We often, often announce things on social channels before we do on the website. You've got to be kind of really structured and organized with what you put on your website, haven't you? Whereas on social, you can be a, a lot more kind of flippant and, and just, just blurt stuff out. So we, so we blurt stuff out and they go, oh, shit, we need to, we need to put it on the website now. How are we going to do that? <laughs> it's obviously yeah, it's obviously all part of a plan 
Obviously, yeah, the plan that you're going to write after you've done the actions. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks, Hugh.